Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Molly Mullen. I am here with the Notre Dame Sisters um, and a number of great speakers for tonight's presentation of Ex uh, Expand Your Horizons. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sister Cynthia, who organizes Expand Your Horizons. Please feel free to leave comments below on Facebook, and we'll try to get to those at the end of the program. Sister Cynthia? Again, I welcome all of the viewers, and I just want to admit to all of our participants that we are going to have a wonderful evening. Um, this is a series called Expand Your Horizons. It's an informative series of gatherings hosted by the education outreach team of the Notre Dame Sisters and Associates. And throughout the past four um, sessions, we've been partnering with people. This time our partnering was, is with the Citizens Climate Lobby, the Omaha chapter. We have an outreach to many groups now working with the uh, environment and the little earth there is shaking because it's teetering and shaking because there's people who want to help it get healthy. So I'm going to give a little introduction, um, inviting you to breathe with the earth and the sun. We have two presentations uh, that are kind of focused on the legislation that can move the earth to more safety. And the first is from Citizens Climate Lobby, Omaha chapter, Mark Welsh. And the second is from Clyde Anderson, who's worked with the Omaha Together One Community Environmental Sustainability Action Team. The other two presentations are by groups that have been taking action and advocating for the earth. The first is from the Creighton Sustainability Programs with two students, Caroline Adrian and Emma Yakely, and Elders for the Earth, um, represented by Carol Windham. And as Molly said, there will be a time for question and answers and comments. So please be sure that you um, send us something on Facebook. And let's go back in time briefly, a quick trip through time. The 200th year birthday for Eunice Foote. She's a hidden scientist who in the mid 1800s, a female scientist who did experiments, which we would now say she discovered greenhouse effect. So the atmospheric gases heat up, but cool slowly. And that creates that trapped air that keeps our earth warmer and warmer. In the mid 1900s, the focus changed from space exploration to noticing the changes in Earth's climate and trying to understand it. So there's a time machine, climate time machine that was being developed. Mathematician Milankovic observed uh, lots of changes through ice core study like a lot of scientists were doing. And during his time of 30 years, he put together all of his data uh, statistics and came up with a plan for, no, it's an experience of a 100,000 year cycle, which we'll be talking about later. Then in 1981 through 1992, Congressman Al Gore ended up putting his research into earth and balance and he started trying to deal with the legislative level. The point for two, the year 2000s was that global awareness was growing and that nature was out of balance. Many of us saw the movie in 2006 that was called An Inconvenient Truth. My major in college was science. So when I saw his presentation, a lot of what I used to teach my students in bits and pieces, which would have been in the 1980s, um, those bits and pieces were all put together on this film. And the graph still stays in my mind because it just exponentially zoomed upward. That brings us to the present time, the 2018, 2019, when the Swedish youth Greta Thunberg inspired a global youth strikes, many of the strikes. The youth were hearing these data about nature's balance being disrupted and they began to talk with one another with the question, are we the last generation? So there was fear for them. And when they gather together under the motivation by Greta, 
it was called the Extinction Rebellion. So this is the picture of the Heathrow Airport in April, 2019. The next two slides, I'm going to just introduce you to two things and then we will watch a short video of Grita. She is presenting in 2019 to the um, US Congress after she crossed the ocean in her little boat with her friends helping her. So she wants us to listen and then we will be listening. And then I want to introduce you to the 1000 year cycle by, by Milankovic and invite you into a silent reflection on inhaling and exhaling. And the earth that is teetering will be breathing. So I'm going to invite you to return to that feeling of the earth being in balance. So we will listen and we will breathe in that moments of silence. And hopefully we'll be sending energy to our earth and people will be motivated to work for the greenness and the health of our earth. on October 8th, 2018. I am submitting this report as my testimony because I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to the scientists. And I want you to put, unite behind the science. And then I want you to take real action. Thank you. Uh, I'll start just with uh, Ms. Toonbury. Uh, you chose to submit uh, the IPCC report in lieu of your written testimony. Uh, could you expand on why it's so important to listen to the science? Well, well, I don't see a reason to not listen to the science. It's such, just such a thing that we should be taking for granted that we listen to the current best available United Science. It's just something that's everyone should do. This is not political opinions, political views or my opinions. This is, this is the science. So, yeah. We have listened to the science for a long time, and we will now be watching an animation from the NASA uh, system. Well, I'm hoping this will work. The earth is going to be moving around and every time the line is blue, which now we would inhale. And when it's blue, we would exhale. And so I invite you to consider the dance with the sun and the earth or possibly just breathing. So we'll take a few moments now to inhale Exhale, inhale, exhale. Imagine that you are on that globe, that you are revolving around the sun as well as rotating on our earth day and night. Inhale, 
exhale. So out of this silence and the purpose of this is that we would uh, experience uh, the balance of the earth. And as we go forward now, we will be listening to the efforts that are being made legislatively, as well as by a couple of agencies we have represented here. So we move over to Mark. And Mark Welsh is the one that I met way back in September for a different project with Nebraskans for Peace. And I knew he was working on this climate citizens lobby. So that he was one of the first I thought about. And so Mark, thank you again for being a part of our partnership as we um, try to work with Earth sustainability. Thank you, Cynthia and, and Molly for putting on this great event. And uh, thank you also to the other people on this panel that will speak after me about their very interesting work on climate change issues. Uh, tonight, I'm going to share with you just a little bit of science of global warming, the history of global warming, and why all of the natural cycles have an alibi for causing global warming. And it proves that humans burning fossil fuels are actually responsible for more than 100% of the Earth's warming right now. Uh, you may think that's sort of strange, but I'll explain later. And we're going to talk about why companies that are dumping their pollution into our air cannot be allowed to do that for free anymore. And most importantly, we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to stop them and how you can make them stop just by picking up your phone and making one call every month. If you can commit to that, you can be a huge part of solving this problem. Now, if my uh, history and science lessons don't put you to sleep like they did me when I was in school many years ago, we will talk about the really interesting stuff and how it will affect our lives and how you can help solve this problem. And I think everyone watching this today would like to make a new friend and talk with them once a month on the phone. And if they knew that just having that regular contact could lead to a solution to climate change. And that's what I'm going to be asking you to do. Now, as uh, Sister Cynthia mentioned, the Earth has been alternating between very long ice ages and shorter intergalactic or interglacial periods for about the past two and a half million years. For the last million years or so, these have been happening roughly every 100,000 years. So that you'd have 90,000 years of ice age, followed by around 20, 000, or 10,000 years of interglacial warm period. And we're about 6,000 years into this warm, but now we, with natural cycles, trying to cool down the planet. And the history of global warming science started back in the 1820s with Joseph Fuhrer, who discovered tiny traces of heat trapping gases in our atmosphere. And he figured out that without these gases, the earth would be 60 degrees Fahrenheit colder on average, and it would be a solid ball of ice. And there would be no life here without those gases. That's 200 years that we've known about this. And then in the 1850s in Europe, uh, John uh, Tyndall discovered that heat trapping gases of water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane. And he linked our digging up and burning coal to increasing these gases in the atmosphere. And at the same time in the United States, it was Eunice Foote, who Cynthia mentioned earlier, the amateur scientist who essentially proved the same thing as this very well-studied scientist in Europe had discovered. And in 1890, Cervantes Arrhenius calculated just exactly how much warmer the planet would become if we doubled and tripled those gases in our atmosphere. And his calculations were over 130 years ago, yet he was able to calculate 
even how much warmer the Arctic would be than the rest of the world. I mean, this is not new science. This is very old. So enough of the history. Now to summarize, we've known for over 200 years what keeps the earth warm for 165 years that more of the heat trapping gases will warm us. And for over 100 years, just how much the planet will warm as we allow companies to pollute our air with carbon dioxide and methane. Now, for just a little more science, and did you like how I wove that a little science into my history lesson there? Uh, if the earth was the size of an apple, the skin of an apple would be 20 times thicker than the earth's atmosphere. It is just the smallest thing, but oh so important to life on this planet. If we didn't have an atmosphere, the earth would just be a solid ball of ice. And there are natural cycles that the sun gets warmer and the sun gets cooler. And since the 1970s, it's, 70s, it's been cooling. So the sun has an alibi. It can't be warming the planet. And all of the volcanoes of the world produce about 1% of the carbon dioxide and 15% of the methane that we humans produce every year. So the volcanoes have an alibi. They're not causing the global warming. And the Earth's orbit and the tilting of the axes toward and away from the sun as we spin around the world or run around the sun uh, when we are close to it can cause the planet to heat up or cool down a little bit. These earth cycles are also working right now and for the past almost 100 years or more to cool the planet. So those also have an alibi. And when it gets extremely cold in one part of the world, like it did here in Omaha, all the way down into Texas this year, getting down to 20 degrees below zero, another part of the world got warmer than normal. And these weather events, they're not climate, they're weather events, some of which are larger climate cycles, they just move heat from one place to another. So it doesn't change the average temperature of the earth. So those also have an alibi. Now I'm going to share a slideshow with you. Hopefully this works. Okay, and, and this is entitled No More Free Pollution. The Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act is a bill that was reintroduced once again this year for the third time in Congress. And it's something that I've been working on for about eight years now with Citizens Climate Lobby. There we go. And little things on my computer are not cooperating here. Let me see if I can move that. Oh, it's just going to. So we are going to talk about the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, which is H.R. 2307 in Congress right now. And the original co-sponsor once again this year is Representative Ted Deutsch, a Democrat from Florida's District 22. And there are 36 co-sponsors of this bill. Last time, a little over a year ago, it was reintroduced, it had eight co-sponsors. And that eight grew to over 80 co-sponsors uh, over the, the year after it was introduced. So we hope these 36 will springboard us to an even higher number. And how it works, how this bill works is really quite simple. We start out, or I should say Congress will start by charging a fee on fossil fuels at the source. So at the mine, at the coal mine, at the oil or gas well, or at the point of import, uh, whether it's coming in on trains, on uh, ships, or the dreaded pipelines, which I don't like because they leak immense amounts of oil. 
The second point is that it will return 100% of the net revenues to households as a dividend, a monthly check or a monthly automatic payment will be made into all households' accounts. And then last is the carbon border adjustment. And the benefits of this bill is that it will cause a net zero carbon emissions by 2050. It's going to provide us with affordable clean energy and it's going to save lives and it's going to put money in our pockets. Now the Energy Innovation Act emissions reductions, if we don't do anything business as usual, there are going to be no reductions in CO2 emissions. And that's going to spell disaster for this uh, for humankind on this planet. Now the um, I need to catch up with my page, my notes pages here. Uh, this green line is what will happen if we pass this bill. Uh, it will drive emissions down to net zero by 2050. By 2030, about a 40% reduction will happen. So that's very important. And this is the most powerful tool that we have to reduce America's uh, carbon pollution. And really, the rest of the world pollution will also be reduced when this bill is enacted. And there's the Paris uh, Agreement commitment by the United States. Uh, this bill would cause us to be below that. And the Clean Power Plan target is way too high. So we need to keep moving forward. So net zero by 2050, uh, this policy will reduce America's fossil fuel pollution by 30% in just the first five years alone and get us to net zero by 2050. It's the single most powerful tool we have to reduce America's carbon pollution. And then we have affordable clean energy. With this policy, the government makes fossil fuels more expensive and businesses compete to provide clean energy solutions. The resulting innovation will reduce our pollution fast and efficiently, leading to plenty of reliable and affordable clean energy for our modern lives. And it will save lives. This policy will improve the health of everyone and save 4.5 million American lives over the next 50 years by reducing the pollution Americans breathe every day. The poor health quality is responsible for as many as one out of 10 Americans deaths today, and it sickens thousands more. Another benefit is it's gonna put money in our pockets. This policy is affordable for ordinary Americans because it puts money in our pockets. The money collected from the fee, from the fossil fuel fee, will be given as a monthly dividend or carbon cash back payment to every American to spend with no restrictions. And most low and middle income Americans will come out financially ahead or break even on this. So that's a good thing. We're going to have affordable, clean energy. And with this policy, the government sets the direction and businesses respond to provide that abundant, affordable, and reliable clean energy. And this is going to get us to net zero pollution faster than anything. As I mentioned, it will save many lives. It puts money in your pocket. I think those deserve to be emphasized. And uh, it's just going to be a good thing for us on, for many, many reasons. And there are many statements of support. You may recognize some of these people. Uh, I personally have met and, and dined with James Hansen when he's come to Omaha multiple times. 
uh, and I've seen Catherine Hayhoe in person uh, quite a few times at our Citizens Climate Lobby events in Washington, D.C. Uh, Bradley Whitford, uh, I'm enjoying the show. Um, oh shoot, now I'm blanking on the name. Um, the West Wing. Uh, my wife Bonnie and I are watching that. It's very uh, fun show to watch. Now, uh, George Schultz, those of you who are old like me, remember him as a former US state uh, and treasury secretary for Republicans. And sadly, he's passed on now, but he said, I fully support the Bipartisan Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Its predictability mitigates price uncertainty and its full dividend return makes it politically durable. It'd be like Social Security. If, if Congress tried to take that away, uh, we'd have a total change in our Congress the next time they got up for reelection. The same would happen once this gets into place and we get our monthly dividends or carbon dividend checks. They try to take those away from us and it, it, it just won't happen. Catherine Hayhoe, uh, one of my favorite climate scientists said, as a scientist, I'm in favor of any legislation that will reduce carbon emissions and has broad based support. I'm delighted that the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act has been introduced in the House of Representatives as it is an ambitious plan to reduce carbon emissions with bipartisan support across the United States political spectrum. And Dr. Hansen, uh, who grew up just over in Iowa a little ways, uh, we now have a climate bill that serves the people by cutting carbon emissions and putting money in people's pockets. This bill gives us the chance to fight climate change seriously and on a big scale. I encourage everyone to support the Bipartisan Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Now, this is where you can come in. You can make one call per month to help get this bill passed into law. That call is to your member of Congress. If you sign up at the website below, actually, that's the wrong website. I didn't, but anyway, if you go there, you can find the right website. And Cynthia, I believe, has the correct website on a slide later in, in this presentation. But you can also call me. That's my personal cell number. So feel free to call me. And I would be happy to talk with anyone about this important bill about climate change. Uh, I'm at, at, at your bidding whenever you want to get a hold of me. So that ends my presentation. And I didn't take as much time as, as I thought I would. So we have, I'm not sure, Cynthia, did you want to do questions now or? Or am I mistaken? And are we on schedule here? I think we're about eight minutes ahead of schedule. Yeah, I might want to check with Molly. Yeah, Molly. Uh, let's do questions now. If you want to stop sharing your screen, we can go back and see, see you, Mark. We've just got one so far. So let me ask you first. Um, can you tell us? Of course, the million dollar question is more about this check. Can you let us know, is it, uh, you know, is it gonna be like the stimulus check? Is it going to be mailed out to people, direct deposited to people? Uh, would it be um, for homeowners, for citizens? Can you get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of how people get their money if this happens? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, for everybody, and it's done by families, so, uh, the way the dividend is calculated is they're going to get all this money in from around four or 5,000 different companies that pay the, the fee, and they're going to have all of this money available to be given out as dividends. And every adult is given one share in a family. So if you've got uh, a mother and father, you, that family gets two shares. And if you have children, each child gets half of a share of this uh, div of the of the fee money so it's calculated out so 
if you're a family of two, no matter what your income level, you will get the same as every other family of two in, in this country. So for instance, Bonnie and I will get the same amount of dividend as Warren Buffett and his wife, even though we're miles apart, uh, worlds apart, you might say financially, we get the same amount of money. We get it, uh, we will get it as a direct deposit into our checking account, just like that's how we get our uh, tax return every year, direct deposited into our checking account. If people don't want that, or if they don't have a, an account that it can be deposited into, they can get a check every month. If they get, uh, if they are on a disability or they get other kinds of social services and they get have a card that they that money is put on that card every month by the government, this money can be put onto that card every month as well. So that's how the, the money is distributed. And uh, the next question is, can you tell us what local politicians are saying about this? Um, uh, you know, our governor, our state representatives here in Nebraska. Well, uh, I, I do like to mention that our representative, Don Bacon, at several, uh, I should say at least two that I was at, uh, town hall meetings over a year ago, there were uh, several other bills and this one introduced. And we have, Citizens Climate Lobby has talked with him uh, multiple times with his staff, even more times about this bill, uh, trying to convince him to be a co-sponsor. And at two of these town hall meetings, he said, of all of the bills out there, I like this one the best. So that's encouraging. And so he needs more encouragement, though, from everyone that's on this call or on this uh, meeting. If you can sign up to make those one calls per month, uh, that's the kind of encouragement that he and the other senators and representatives in Nebraska need to hear. They need to hear from us. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I think the title of your presentation could be one call per month, because that is, I think that's uh, got to be the key takeaway for everybody. Um, if everybody's happy, I think that we can move on and hear from our Creighton students for now. And then we'll see if there are more questions that come in a little bit later. So I'm going to turn it over to Caroline and Emma. And uh, if you want to unmute yourselves and introduce yourselves, I'm just going to pin you so that you're side by side. Perfect. Go ahead. Awesome. I'm just going to pull up my presentation here. Sorry. Um, and then let's see. There we go. Can everyone see it? Get a thumbs up. Perfect. Awesome. Um, so I'm Caroline and I'm a senior at Creighton. I'm studying environmental science and Spanish. And today I'm going to be talking about divestment. Um, hi, and I'm Emma Yackley. I'm a sophomore at Creighton studying medical anthropology and an athlete on the women's soccer team. And I'm going to be talking about uh, kind of just the culture, cultural movement here at Creighton with sustainability. So to give a little bit of a background, um, an endowment, so the appropriate word should have been endowment, not a divestment, because first we're going to talk about endowments. So um, an endowment is a fund, basically a pool of donations and other capital that is invested with the expectation that it will accrue interest. So it's basically like a really stock heavy savings account. Um, as of 2018, the endowment was disclosed to be $568 million. Um, with 60 million of that directly invested in the fossil fuel industry. So I'm going to repeat that because that's super duper high. So 10.6%, $60 million was directly invested in the primary corporations driving the climate crisis. Um, sorry. So as individuals who would like to live on earth into our old age and as students, we realized that we needed to take action and hold the university to a higher standard. So in the spring of 2019, we held our first Silence for the Climate event, and we organized a protest um, attended by over 100 students, faculty and staff members um, calling for three primary goals. 
Um, and the first and foremost one was divestment. Sorry, I should have stayed here. So divestment is basically moving all stocks, bonds, and other financial investments that are tied to the fossil fuel industry and moving them to more sustainable, comparably performing industries or sectors. So um, that's what we were fighting for. And so 2019 was the first time that we had a public demonstration about that. Um, our second goal for our public demonstration was that we wanted the university to have a mandatory climate education uh, component for all students. And then third was an expedited carbon neutrality date. Um, in 2013, the proposed carbon neutrality date was 2050, but the UN states that we could reach 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit of warming by 2030 on our current trajectory, um, as Mark talked about already. Um, so, and by that time we would experience catastrophic sea level rise um, and so we needed more urgent action. Um, so then last fall, the Creighton Climate Movement in, in tandem with our student government uh, wrote a referendum for the university's constitution. And the vote was basically on inserting a clause that would prohibit direct investment in the fossil fuel industry. Um, it passed through all the necessary bodies of our student union and our student government. And we made a video to educate students on the complex issues of divestment. I urge all of you, if this is something you're interested in, please look at the video. It's very well done. You just have to uh, Google Creighton, um, Creighton Climate Movement Divestment, but not today. Um, and then we basically, during this vote, um, we had a record high voter turnout. About half of the undergraduate student body voted and 85.6 voted in support of divestment. And it was sent to the desk of our president, Father Hendrickson, and he sent out an email response saying that, quote, Creighton will not totally divest at this time. So um, in February of 2020, several months later, um, it was the anniversary of the previous months or previous years silence for the climate events. And so we marched to the boardroom on the fourth floor of the Harper, which is building, which is in the business college. And this was at the same time that the board of trustees were meeting. And um, we basically asked publicly in our march that they consider divestment. And we read the names of all 42 board members and recited an excerpt um, of a um, papal encyclical called the Laudato Si, which is basically um, about the care for our common home, the earth. And our message was essentially um, for these, these board members to realize the power that they had to make this decision and also the money um, that, you know, the, the, the money that was enabling um, kind of, the, not kind of, the destruction of our earth essentially. So it was a really powerful message and we think that we sent the message that we had hoped to. So um, over this winter break, um, Father Hendrickson, our president, sent out an email announcing partial divestment of an endowment from fossil fuels and a commitment to sustainability. And then um, more recently on New Year's Eve, he announced full divestment. So we achieved our goal. So yeah, that was basically the one good thing about 2020, 2021. So $60 million are no longer um, invested directly into the largest fossil fuel companies in the world. So I think that's a big win. Okay. Um, and then, so Caroline and many other students had really great work with that. And just the on-campus um, support with that has been super awesome. And so I guess I will be speaking about a smaller scale thing, but more, I guess, rooted with what, what it means to be a regular student at Creighton. So um, I'm a regular student at Creighton, and so is Caroline. I'm gonna to touch more on this later. So I had my first contact with Creighton Sustainability as a compost volunteer. So that entailed sorting through dining hall organics and plastics. So that was another, Thing that started this, or I guess it would be last semester in the fall, um, composting our dining hall waste. And so I spent three to four hours each week digging through the trash and which was, it was a really great experience because the more time I spent with this trash, it really started to follow me around. And it, I saw it everywhere. And I became super mindful of the waste that I generated and the waste that others were generating. And so one of these sites was on our soccer field at Morrison. So this is where our men's and women's soccer teams um, practice and play. And so we have these little tiny paper cups that were single use and people use them um, in favor of their water bottles. And so these 
bins on the practice on the field were being just full were full of them and i saw this and i said well how is how can this be happening so i hauled down one of our compost bins and set it on the field and if you the corner on the bottom right uh you can see that one of those compost bins with our men's team posing with it um so athletics started composting that day so that was super awesome uh and this was a good start but I thought about like with the divestment and the compost pilot on campus, we need to be doing something more um, within athletics because we seemed kind of isolated from the sustainability movement that had been happening. Um, so next slide. So what I did, well, I started talking to my peers. I started talking to my coaches and the senior staff within athletics and talking about how we could divide, divert our facilities like how we used energy and where our waste was going such as the cups um but more so the really cool thing about athletics is the large platform that we have at our disposable uh, at our disposal um, to reach a large fan base in our surrounding communities and so one of the ideas that we had to use with this large platform um, were green games and so similar to a pink out for that supports breast cancer and awareness, um, green games are super um, great, I, great way for, um, to promote sustainability and environmental stewardship. However, the way that we wanted to, I guess, frame these green games, um, if you wanna move on to the next slide, uh, was to show like these were not, this is not a special event. We're having a green game, but this is not something that's, oh, look, we're recycling, we're composting. This is something that Creighton does. If you go to our law school, you'll see that we have recycling bins. If you go to a soccer game, we're composting. It's something that we do. It's not just a special thing that needs to be done. It's just something that we do and that we're trying to integrate into our culture here at Creighton. So I guess drawing, coming back to the, I'm a regular student, um, being a regular student at Creighton means being like in practicing sustainable behaviors. And it's something that every student can engage with and become a part of. Um, so yeah, it's not this crazy thing. Oh, look, we're, you know, helping the earth. It's just, it's something that we do. It's something that we want to be a part of our culture at Creighton and as students and young adults. And that that's all. <laughs> Thanks so much for just I'm here myself. Thank you both so much. Um, thank you for those great presentations. If you're willing to stick around, um, we made and divested um, already, or if there's a hard deadline to do so. I wasn't sure if that has been addressed yet. Yeah. So um, in the email, uh, basically, Father Hendrickson, they have their. They have a plan to divest, so it's within I think like a like two to five year timeline. Um, but they have a hard deadline, which is really promising um, because it's very easy I think for organizations to say this is something we'd like to do, but then you know actually having a deadline for that is like really good. So yeah. Well, thank you so much, and we might have a few more questions coming in. I'd like to turn it over now uh, to Clyde Anderson from OTOX uh, Action Committee. So um, I'll send it over to you. Thank you, Cynthia and, and Molly, and really uh, for our following up uh, after Mark and, and Carolyn and Emmy. So uh, doing great work and, and I'll uh, bring you up to date on, on some of the things going on right here in Omaha. And uh, Omaha Together One Community was organized in 1993. Uh, it actually didn't take on that name, uh, short for OTOC, until 1995. And there's 20, uh, currently 27 member institutions uh, that are working together to teach people uh, how to become effective leaders, explore their legitimate interests, do solid research, engage in solid but respectful public discourse, hold elected officials accountable, 
and create positive change through collective action. And uh, two of these members uh, are Notre Dame Sisters and Sisters of Mercy. They're what we call solidarity members. And uh, back in uh, 2013, periodically we have what we call house meetings or listening sessions. So our member institutions uh, hold meetings within our, our churches or, or other organizations so like uh, uh, Notre Dame Sisters and to identify what are the local concerns that people have. And uh, we just got through uh, having a series of these uh, since the first of the year to come up with uh, issues to take before the candidates for the uh, city uh, mayor and, and city council. But anyway, back in 2013, we had a series of those. And one of the things that came up was uh, how to create a more sustainable city and economy that respects our natural environment that was identified, it was identified as one of these uh, itch issues for OTOC to take uh, uh, future action. So in early 2014, they formed the Environmental and Sustainability Action Team. And uh, one of our first actions was sponsoring an OPPD candidate accountability session. It was on September 8th, 2014 at St. Pius Church. And I think we had about 75, 80 people there. And even that large a crowd for um, OPPD, you know, who really paid much attention to Omaha Public Power District uh, board members. And, uh, but anyway, we, we really brought up some good issues and put them on the spot to hold them, hey, will you work with us on these issues? And uh, one of the issues was about phasing out coal, uh, coal as a source of electricity uh, in uh, their uh, jurisdiction. And uh, shortly after that, in 2016, they had a series of public meetings about uh, the long range power plan uh, for OPPD. And we were able to, <coughs> excuse me, convince uh, OPPD to phase out the uh, burning of coal at their North Omaha power station. And one of the big things, and here's where Adi Poor, who's been such a fantastic leader in the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic crisis, but she was really helpful. And uh, Douglas County has monitors for particulate matter. Northeast Omaha has one of the highest particulate matter counts in the whole Douglas County. And that's why it has one of the nation's highest uh, incidents of asthma. So it, it's an important issue. And, and that's the problem when you live next to a coal fired power plant, but then it's old and didn't have very good uh, cleaning. But anyway, um, then uh, in fall of 2015, OPPD announced that they were going to uh, uh, raise the fixed part of the bill, what they call the fixed rate fee. It was about $10.75, and they were going to raise it to $30, almost tripling it. And we, uh, a lot of <laughs> customers didn't really understand how this billing system worked. And so we held a series of meetings um, and mostly at First United Methodist Church uh, to educate people what this is all about. I mean, uh, people on fixed incomes, uh, all of a sudden that, that are small electricity users, we're going to see their bill in some cases double because they, the usage part of their bill was small because they didn't use that many kilowatt hours. And so this decision by the OPPD board to increase the fixed portion of the bill um, tended to benefit large power users and it discouraged conservation because basically it made it cheaper to use more power. And uh, so although we opposed that and we got a lot of people uh, to uh, testify against this, all about the only win we got was uh, they did extend Instead of doing it all at once, they did it over a three year period. But if you look at your OPPD electric bills, you see a $30 fixed fee on each monthly bill. And uh, another th thing campaign we had was uh, educating people about climate change. And of course, one of the first things we have to do, everything that OTOC does is by consensus. So we had to 
educate all of our member institutions about this issue and get them to adopt a statement on this uh, so we could move forward and, and we actually did some educational moves. But anyway, it says, flowing from the faith traditions of OTOC member congregations, OTOC's belief is that the climate is a common good belonging to all and meant for all. Our position is that the Earth's climate is warming dangerously, that the principal cause is human activity, and it was a little hard getting everybody to accept that little clause, and that unless immediately addressed, our local community will experience adverse consequences, as will all life on the planet. Therefore, OTOC will seek out and promote public and private policies that reduce our community's contributions to climate change and promote appropriate adaptations. And it, just getting this uh, adopted was, was a major undertaking, believe me. It's, uh, it's like herding cats. Um, then uh, the current issues that we are working on at, uh, and we, uh, ESAT is the short name, uh, and somebody corrected, we used to be environment and sustainability, but somebody said that's not good English, it should be environmental. But anyway, uh, we watch uh, the uh, state legislature and, and monitor bills of environmental importance. And we submitted letters for the hearings uh, on LB 266, which would adopt the Renewable Energy Standards Act, and also LB 483, provide for a climate change study and action plan. Unfortunately, those two bills are stuck in the Natural Resources Committee. Neither of them were uh, made priority bills. So uh, we're hoping next year in the second half of this session to uh, get those out of committee. And then the other two bills, 306 and 396, we didn't submit letters, but we encouraged our members to. And because we, unfortunately, the hearings were really compact this year. They, uh, they didn't have general sessions. They had all the hearings in the uh, front end of this session. So we just didn't get our act together in time to submit letters on 306 and 396. But both of those are out of committee and looks like they stand a good chance of uh, getting passed. And other issues we're working on is Omaha waste collection. We spent a lot of time lobbying the city on the new waste collection contract, uh, promoting originally the mayor didn't want to compost yard waste, but we at least got 12 weeks a year of uh, separate collection of yard waste and having it taken to the um, uh, Grow composting site. And uh, the rest of the year, they will collect it separately, but you got to put a $2 tag on every bag of your yard waste, which I have seen very few people exercising that. And we continue to work on OPPD issues. Uh, for instance, the decarbonization, uh, decarbonization plan. And uh, we also are promoting adoption of the 2018 edition of the International Energy Conservation Code. Um, Omaha uh, adopted it in the December of 2019, but it's a little watered down. They, uh, developers and builders lobbied the, uh, 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 I guess that's in the planning department, and then the city council, um, they, they took some of the conditions out. And right now it's before the Bellevue City Council, and they, the developers and builders are lobbying Bellevue City Council to also adopt the Omaha version instead of the full version. Now, Washington County adopted the full version. And so um, uh, that, that's something that we are trying, but we unfortunately are not, OTOC's not a, have, have much influence in uh, Sarpy County, but uh, we do have a couple members of our committee who are I'm uh, going to go down and testify. And then we have a new research issue, and we're just getting started on it. As you may have read, back in March 22nd, I believe it was, uh, uh, of this year, Lincoln adopted a uh, climate action plan. And we really want to see Omaha do the same thing. 
And so this is a new project we're going to be working on. And uh, you're certainly welcome to come join us, uh, especially if you uh, belong to one of our member institutions. And we meet on the first Tuesday evening uh, of the month at 7 p.m. Right now by Zoom, we normally met over here at First United Methodist Church. And I look up at the window and see the steeple where we live just a block away. But anyway, that's where we normally will meet. And maybe by late summer, we'll be back there again. So, uh, and uh, if you'd like to uh, attend one of our meetings, just send me, there's my email address send me an email and I'll uh, send you the Zoom link and you can join us to, uh, and I, I'll send you out an agenda and so forth. Also, uh, uh, as Cynthia mentioned, uh, OTOC has one of these candidate accountability sessions. By the way, when we had our last one for OPPD candidates, we had over 350 people there. You talk about really impressing the candidates, that many people at St. Leo's Church showing up for uh, their OPPD candidates, uh, it really impressed. And we, as a result of this uh, activism, we now uh, have a very progressive OPPD board and that decarbonization plan is pretty progressive. And uh, so it, it does make a change. And that's where having people power as opposed to money or to money power. That's the only way you can fight all, all the money power is by having a lot of organized people power. And that's what OTOC is all about. And anyway, we're having this candidate accountability session on Sunday, April 25th from 2.30 to 4.30 PM. And uh, you can, for the registration, you can call Gloria, Osterberry with Augustana Lutheran Church, or uh, Cynthia suggested I, you guys who are into this modern technology, the QR code is right there. You hold your phone up and you can um, register <laughs> or bring up the screen. I even tested it and it worked. So, uh, but anyway, um, if you have any questions, otherwise uh, I hopefully stayed pretty close to my 10 minutes. <clears throat> Thank you so much. We have a few questions that came in, but I thought we could ask those um, in a couple more minutes um, after we hear from our next speaker, Carol Windrum. So we'll go and hear from her. Well, hi, everybody. It's just been great fun to um, get reacquainted with some of our climate activists across the community. And Caroline and Emma, it was so so neat to watch your tenacity over the last couple of years working on that divestment at Creighton. And you will never know how that just ripples out to our broader community. So I just, I just want to say, way to go. It's more than just Creighton. You're really setting a good example. So, um, well, I'm here tonight to talk about Elders for the Earth. So we've got students from Creighton, uh, and then we have elders. And Elders for the Earth is uh, not an organization. It's mainly an event. And this October, October 12, 13, and 14, we will be having a Chautauqua-like event. This will be our sixth time that we've, sixth year that we've done it. Every year we've been at a state park, except of course last uh, last year, we did it uh, via Zoom, but we hope maybe to be at Platte River State Park again, October 12th, 13th, and 14th. Elders for the Earth, that's just exactly, it's designed, it's a multi-day event. It's designed for people 55 years and older. Uh, and we focus on that generation because those of us who are near retirement or retirement age, we have more time, we have usually more resources, and we have decades of life experience to bring to the climate crisis that we are in now. So Chautauqua, some of you are, might be familiar with that concept. Chautauqua is, is kind of sort of like a summer camp, and it's a three-day event for Elders for the Earth. 
and people come and some of them commute, but we encourage people to stay in cabins or tents. And um, the days are full of experts talking to us about climate, talking to us about policy changes in the unicameral, um, experts that are, are on organic farms and talking to us about the regenerative movement in the soil. We've had uh, people from Citizens Climate Lobby come and talk to us. We've had people from Sierra Club come and talk to us. We've had people from OTOC come and talk to us. So it's the, it's the intellectual kind of stimulation. We want to learn more, but it's also the arts. And so we have breakout sessions and people can choose. We've had people writing poetry about uh, the climate. We've had small groups writing new songs and performing them. We go outside, imagine that. We go outside and we've had forest bathing and we've had, um, we've had a workshop on how to take a nature photography. We have had a workshop on green burials. We've had a whole variety of things. And a couple years ago, we had students from Creighton come. We had students from Lincoln, University of Nebraska and Lincoln come. And we had a, an evening and it was called The World is in Jeopardy. And it was a Jeopardy game. And it was all taking the content from the um, drawdown, the drawdown book. So we had students from Creighton come. So it's not just a bunch of old people all the time. Uh, we, also, we also want to be a model to others on how to have a multi-day conference and have it be zero waste. So we were very intentional. Emma, you were talking about integrating the culture at Creighton. This is what we want to do in those three days. We want to have a zero waste. So uh, people, we wash our own dishes, we compost. At the end of each day, we go into the bathrooms and gather up all the paper towels. So we want to model how to do uh, a zero waste multi-day conference. I am going to screen share now and take you all to our website. And uh, I'm just gonna let some of these pictures uh, tell you a little bit more. This was the last time, of course, that we could meet in person. And um, this is just a little scrapbook. So if you're curious, about Elders for the Earth, just go to our website, eldersfortheearth.com, and you can kind of see uh, Elders for with a number four, uh, eldersfortheearth.com. So you can see kind of things we did, and we've got some young students in here as well. But you see that little picture in the middle, you see how dedicated we are on the zero waste. So people scrape their plates um, and put their paper in. And um, so we do that. We've got the workshops. We've had farmers come and talk to us about how they are taking care of the soil. Uh, Janine, Janice Molhoff is the woman right in the center. Uh, she has been a very dedicated person of Elders for the Earth. She is now uh, one of the directors for OPPD. And then we know that we all learn different ways. So you'll see over the left-hand side, uh, somebody putting a puzzle together. So we always have a puzzle table. If people get tired of listening uh, to talking heads, they just, uh, they just go and work on a puzzle. And this one is in the evening and you can see she has her little glass of wine. The other thing we do is we try intentionally support local. So we have local wines in the evening. We have local musicians, we dance. Um, so it's a, it's a left brain and a right brain activity. Uh, so you can kind of see some of the things, some of the people. So I'm gonna take us, and then at the end of the event, we always have a sacred, Kind of ceremony and we plant a tree. 
Um, so we now have five trees planted between Plant River State Park and Mahoney State Park. So that's kind of our legacy too. But let me take you back up here. We are not an organization, but what we do offer people every single week, 52 weeks a year, is we offer them something they can do every single week. So if you're interested in getting one or two ideas of something you can do every single week, um, just let me know and I'll give you that. I'll give you the email address in a minute. But so this is an example. This is, whoa, this is the weekly action for April 11th. Uh, watch Kiss the Ground. And it's on regenerative agriculture and it tells you how to do that. Um, the week before, it's a salute, a virtual salute to the parks. Anyway, um, you will get every single week something that you can learn, you can do. Sometimes it's on, especially during this legislative season in the unicameral, it will be contact your state senator on supporting a state climate action plan. So that's what we do all week, uh, all year. Then we also had, for the very first time, we had a book study um, for uh, four, four weeks, and it was virtual, of course, and it was a book study on Nature's Best Hope by Doug Tallamy. And so that's the first time we've offered something uh, in between our annual conference in the fall, and it was very successful. So I think uh, we're going to be offering another book study um, uh, in, the, in the future. So I think I am at my time. Let me stop that for a moment. And I think I think I covered the basis on elders for the earth. Again, we uh, we've just so enjoyed students coming and joining us from time to time. Last year we had a we had a fashion show. We had a thrift store fashion show and we talked about the fashion industry as one of the biggest polluters that there are. So we had great fun. We had models in their thrift store fashions. And um, so we try every year to have different themes and bring different uh, topics under the heading, of course, of living in the climate crisis. It's a great opportunity to bring people together, to be supported, to get ideas for what they can do in the future. Thank you so much. We just have a couple of questions that came in. I'm just going to go back to gallery view so we can also see one another. Um, and Mark, if you want to help me, do we still have Mark with us? Um, if we could get some help deciding um, uh, who wants to take these questions or if anybody just wants to unmute themselves and chime in. Um, first uh, question that we got was um, Clyde was speaking about Otox work with the coal plants in North Omaha. And a good question is, and I know we can do an entire presentation just on this question alone, um, but could we talk about the environmental justice aspect also a little bit of the coal plants uh, being specifically in North Omaha, which uh, is a disproportionately high member of low and moderate income families and people of color to the rest of Omaha. So um, I don't know if Carol, you would like to speak or if any of the students have an opinion, I'll leave it to you all. Well, I think that uh, when we were participating in those hearings, of course, we have several North Omaha congregations that are a member of the uh, OTOC, uh, which by the way, OTOC is a, a membership organization of institutions and not individuals. So when we testify, we testify for, uh, for these institutions. And, but anyway, um, we were able to uh, make that a major issue uh, of, about uh, environmental justice. And uh, as a result, OPPD uh, is going from five, they have five coal-fired units up there. That I think the light latest plan is they're gonna convert three to natural gas and the other two are going to be uh, scrapped or abandoned. And so uh, when that's done in 2023, uh, it will be a relatively still putting out carbon dioxide, but it'll be much cleaner. The particulate matter will, will be uh, 
almost eliminated. The, the other big environmental justice issue for North Omaha is the lead soil contamination from the uh, uh, Sarco plant that was on the riverfront. And that's, that's another, like you say, story in itself. But North Omaha has suffered from a lot of environmental injustice. Carol, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think Clyde covered it. Thank you. Uh, and then another question that Clyde, I think, could answer was, it just struck us that you said that um, with all the yard waste that we recommend composting, um, because there's a $2 tag that you have to put on your yard waste bags uh, going forward, um, what are some of your recommendations that people do with their yard waste? And if people aren't putting them in bags like they used to, um, uh, are you worried that people are going to be doing anything with it that they oughtn't be? Well, some people can compost their own yard waste on site. We, we don't uh, 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 collect our grass clippings, for example. Uh, we, we compost it just by, uh, we use a composting mower. And, uh, but we do have a small compost bin, but I have a bad back. And as you age, turning, it does require turning the compost bin regularly to prevent it from putting off methane. Uh, and that's, that's why uh, sending your uh, yard waste to Omagro site, they turn it over and prevent or minimize the amount of methane uh, produced. But uh, I was certainly take advantage of the free yard waste collection starts May 17th and runs for six weeks in the spring. The reason it's starting so late is because they wanted to get enough grass clippings uh, because that provides the sugars and so forth to help digest the uh, brown, what they call the brown yard waste, the twigs and the, and the leaves. And, uh, and then they'll have a six week period in, in the fall. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can put it out at other times, but then you have to pay the two dollars per bag um, if you do if you can't compost it yourself or take it to one of the collection sites, like hauling it to Omagro, which is south of the uh, Papio Sanitation uh, Sewer Sewage Plant in Sarpy County. And a question for the college students about composting: Do you have recommendations for people who? Um, don't have their own yards, who live in apartments, who live in dorms, um, on how they can successfully compost. It seems like you might be the, the people who would know. I know personally for me, um, I there are several different drop-off locations within Omaha. So um, behind, I just know like, you know, around Creighton's area, but Exist Green um, in Dundee, if you go behind there, there's a ton of drop-offs um, and a lot of actually different coffee shops. Um, it's just pretty easy to take those on your walk. Um, so yeah, Emma, do you have any other suggestions? Um, I'm not sure how many people drink coffee, but I know that coffee grounds um, a lot, that's generated a lot. So I have a lot of house plants and coffee grounds are great. I mean, even for gardens, uh, great for gardens. Plants love coffee grounds and probably other compostable waste as well. It kind of depends on what you're composting, but if you have like smaller gardens, that's like a great way to work that in. Um, and yeah, like Caroline said, there's um, a number of drop-off sites around Omaha, I think. And yeah, I, that's about all I can think of. Okay, well, I'm happy to hand it back over to Mark for our next section. I just wanted to comment that uh, I've got two, two, and I'm working to build a third compost pile in our backyard. Uh, we're in the process of turning our home into a food forest. So that's something that anybody could do too. If you think about planting a tree at your home, think about a fruit tree because a fruit tree will feed the pollinators, the honeybees, and you after the food uh, ripens. Plus it gives you shade, which is why most people plant trees. Well, if you're gonna plant a tree, why not sit under an apple tree and reach up every now and then in the fall and grab an apple? And there's nothing more local and more delicious than an apple out of your own backyard or 
peach or pear, which we have peach and pear trees at our house. And we get coffee grounds from a coffee shop in buckets, two at a time. We bring them home, we mix them with leaves, and we make compost year round. This stuff's in the dead of winter. When it was 20 degrees below zero, the compost was over 100 degrees in the center. So, so next up on our, uh, I have to get to where I'm supposed to be talking here. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to be working with Cynthia? If there are no more questions or comments that Molly uh, has spotted, um, then the 22nd idea, Mark, would be your question. OK. Um, uh, we have, and, and is, you're going to share a screen with our contact information? Um, Let's have them, um, if anybody, but they're 20 second, last 20 seconds, that way they can be seen. Um, I'll share that if we're ready for that. Okay. Here, let me share, let me share first. Okay. Here's my 20 seconds <laughs> with the correct URL, cclusa.org slash MCC, monthly calling of Congress or monthly calling campaign. Please go there and sign up. Uh, we need your help, and it is effective. If five people call a state senator, that's groundswell. If 20 people call a federal representative, that's huge, just 20. So be one of the 20 and help us out. And if everybody else wants to take a turn, uh, Caroline, if you want to go next, 20 seconds, last thoughts. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess my, my ask is, I don't know, consider where your money goes. Um, look at your portfolio, um, look at your investments and, you know, whether that be um, your retirement, IRA, whatever, just, you know, be cognizant of where you put your money and know that being a citizen and being a consumer are not two separate things. Thank you, Emma. Um, I hope that trash follows everyone. And I hope that a lot of people can notice and spend time with the trash that they're generating or um, living with and can take note of that. Thank you. And Clyde? I just want to encourage people. We, uh, If you live in Omaha and if you're a registered voter, we have an important election coming up on May 11th. And uh, Find out what the candidates' positions are on environmental issues and vote. So that's, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of things we can't, uh, that we can do as individuals, but in some cases, we need to have good, responsible, elected officials. Thank you. And Carol. Well, I just want to encourage all those 55 and older to uh, claim your expertise and your life experience and uh, find a way to join us for uh, this wonderful Chautauqua event that's going to be in October. It's a great way to get pumped up and to feel the strength of the community uh, to make a difference. Yes, thank you. And, and I have been to a couple of those. They are wonderful. And Clyde, I've been to your OTOC events. They are wonderful as well. And uh, I'm just so proud of the students at Creighton, what you guys have done. It's just, it's just amazing what just uh, you, you people can do. It's, it's wonderful. It makes me want to retire because I know the world is in good hands. <laughs> OK, so. Now I had to make an edit on my screen, so I will have to have this process going on here from current slide. So we have listened to the science and you had some breathing and the earth is breathing better for our energy going out. It's amazing to me what this group has presented and I look forward to listening to this again. Um, so now it's the time to choose some actions. And you've heard of a few invitations and I'm trusting that I am, yeah, I'm, un, I'm un, unmuted, sorry. 
we want you to know that the presenters are um, the presenter content information is right here and each of them has had a chance to say a few things so um take a quick look and molly is going to be posting this on the facebook as i understood yes i'm just so if you saw any links in powerpoints we posted them as comments on the facebook page and then we'll also post them on the notre dame sisters blog with these slides um just for future reference so we yes. saw a lot of great organizations and a lot of great articles uh and videos so those will all be in the comments and at notre dame sisters.org Thank you, Molly, for making that available. Um, I had to go and look up Elders for the Earth, Carol, because you mentioned it's Elders with a digit for, and I thought, I can't remember what's on my slide. <laughs> so that's why I did that. And also notice that there's two E's, one for the and one for Earth. I checked that out also. I'd like to just comment to Emma. When you talked about the trash, if you go forward in the video with Greta Agrida talking, the next thing is she's asked about what would she do if she saw somebody throwing trash in the ocean? And her comment is worth going to hunt for because she basically tells them, well, I would first look at what am I doing and then I would tell them to stop. And that's kind of a, the idea is we have to do our part too. And so Mark, Okay, Mark has already put this out uh, with a good, strong promotion. I just want to say, as soon as he told me about this, I did go and sign up. And the uh, link I have here, Mark, is that the correct one then? Yes, it is. Okay, so it's two C's, the L, Citizens. Yes, Citizens Climate Lobby USA.org slash monthly calling campaign. Okay, so that's one of there's other ways to find that you can contact one of us, but thanks for uh, repeating that for me, Mark. Yes, and thank you for sharing it as well. And then we had just a few things here. Um, the April 19th to 24th, if you're with email and have done any donations here in Omaha or read some things, you know that it's Omaha Do Good Week. So that's coming up. Earth by Earth Day USA. This is a moment if anyone has something they want to promote speak up okay um otox accountability mark uh, pardon me floyd gave the uh, contact information for that so that's also been put on the facebook comments june 13th is otox is celebrating community and i want to do a little private push here to the adults listening because or anybody who likes grape jelly sister joan in my community and i have been making grape jelly and it was on our community celebration of spirit. And I'm donating some for this auction. So if you want some grape jelly, make the price go up by bidding on it. Thank you. And of course, that's grape jelly grown sustainably uh, by grapes grown at the Notre Dame Sisters Mother House in North Omaha. Isn't that right? Yes, six, six vines that the Sister Mary Beth Kubesh, for those who went to high school here at Notre Dame, that was Sister Mary Beth in our days but her grapes have been producing for a long time. And so we've been enjoying eating them, some of them, but most of them have gotten made into wine before Sister Joan and I, oh, we didn't make the wine. I took them to my sister's friend out on the farm. So they made wine, but now Joan and I were making jelly. So this will be an opportunity for you to help fund Otox events. And the last comment on there is just a reference to the Glasgow, that's way in November. Carol, would you please repeat? Uh, you mentioned an October event. I, I did. Elders for the Earth, October 12th, 13th, and 14th. It's too soon to tell whether it'll be virtual or uh, at Platte, Platte River State Park. Okay, and you have her um, link here. You can go to that website. If, or just look for that, but that's not till October, but keep your eyes open for that. Correct. And I'm just gonna give a special thank you to Mark. You have been planning this with me ever since I invited you the first time. Mark also works with Nebraskans for Peace Omaha. And then of course the Citizens Climate Lobby. So Mark, your skills and you're teaching me a lot of this stuff for uh, Zoom and Facebook. I appreciate it and we all get to benefit. 
So well, as, thank you, you, as you, it's been great working with you. Okay. Um, so I'm thanking you for making every day an Earth Day and invite you to go forth and reuse, reduce, recycle. And when I showed this to Mark, he added another word. Redesign. Redesign. So we're going to be redesigning our cars and electrical things. And Molly has a few comments for this. Certainly, if you want to get uh, information about Expand Your Horizons, uh, you can send me an email uh, at mmullen at notredamesisters.org so you can get information about upcoming lectures um, and then just continue to follow us on Facebook and that would be the way to also find us. Thanks. Okay, and then Molly has upgraded our communication here at Notre Dame by putting us on Twitter and doing Instagram. So feel free to visit our website. It's always changing. So may I have a PS? Okay. Um, OPPD announced just this week, today actually they made it public that they are in the process of changing their strategic directive number seven, which is their environmental directive. It's what the board tells the staff to do. That's how they really give the staff direction from the board of directors. So please go to our CCL Omaha on Facebook or website and watch there over the next few days. Uh, we will be making an announcement on changes that we would like them to make, to make that even stronger. So now that they've op sort of opened up this book, we want to write in their pages a little stronger language. Okay, so I just put that back there in case somebody wanted to get your phone number, Mark. That might be something to respond to immediately is 402-510-7565. Okay, now I'm going back to our ending. So to all the viewers, we thank you for coming. This will be posted on our website and our, our fa Facebook and possibly in the future on our website. So I would just invite you on this last um, little thing here. I'm not going to replay the whole animation, but just to realize that this um, breathing with the earth, breathing with nature is the way we are going to bring balance to our own um, lives. So thank you for coming and a special thank you to all of our panelists and speaker. And thank you, Molly. So we'll just rest a little while here and then say good night. <laughs>